Are we in business? I think so. Um, hi, I'm Ellis Woodman. I'm the director at the Architecture Foundation. And welcome to Bedtime Stories, which is um, a slot that Alessia Pavaro has been curating for us throughout the extent of the 100-day studio. And uh, the inevitable has happened that um, somebody has dropped out today, so I've been roped in. Um, but it's a kind of pleasure for me to uh, seize the opportunity to read some writing by the architect James Gowan, who is this figure here. This is a book that James and I worked on together that uh, came out in 2008. And um, yeah, I guess a sort of collected works in a big 30,000 word um, interview with him. Um, and I got to know James uh, when he was in his mid 80s by the time I got to know him, but he was, um, it was quite soon after I started writing uh, for, as a, in a professional capacity. Um, for building design. I think I started there in 2003 and a couple of years later I went to see him having heard that he'd been building uh, some hospital buildings in um, in Italy and thought that they might make the subject of a, um, a building review for building design. Um, as it happened I never did end up writing about his, the, the, doing that building review but I um, sort of spent an afternoon with him and was immensely charmed and um, became sort of yeah, fascinated by his history and his work and, and by, by him himself. Um, and he really became for me a sort of, uh, certainly a friend, but also in a way as an ideal reader when I was learning to write or starting writing professionally. Um, and he'd, he'd have a kind of constant dialogue about the things that I was writing and this book kind of took about four years for us to put together and, and in a sense that the, the, um, the interview, the, the dialogue between him and me is, is a bit of a fiction and that it's assembled from many, many hours, <laughs> hundreds of hours of conversation uh, to try and establish a sort of narrative of his life. Um, but yeah, I th think not just a very special architect but a, a a special writer and uh, teacher, and uh, he was um, the te he began teaching in 1956, thereabouts, I think, and uh, the first generation of students at the AA that he taught included figures like Richard Rogers and Quinlan Terry and Christopher Woodward. Um, later, there were people of the Paul Shepard and Tony Fresson generation at the AA. Um, and for, for Tony particularly, he, James was a big um, influence. And then latterly, teaching at the Royal College of Art in the 80s, there was a whole other generation of um, people like Alex de Riker and um, Stephen Taylor um, and um, um, Mike Tonkin. And uh, there's this uh, kind, of, kind of succession of uh, very remarkable um, architects, I think, sort of emerged under his tutelage. Um, I'm going to, um, this, my, my book's got a few of his bits of writing in, but uh, I'd recommend also getting this one, which is a, not a very well put together publication, but it's got quite a lot of his texts in. And um, I was going to, I'm going to try and read, I mean, I've chosen ones that, that aren't, don't require pictures particularly, and they, they tend to be kind of shorter pieces. Um, but the, the, I think this first one I'm going to read, Home, an English, a Home, a Castle for an Englishman, is quite a significant, um, uh, a significant essay for him, of a sort of almost a sort of manifesto, and it's written after the um, he's completed work on the Schreiber House, which is a project that he refers to at the end of this piece, and um, or maybe you can see here. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, this is a um, a house on um, Hampstead, West Hampstead Heath, and um, very severe externally and with an extraordinary, extraordinary elaborate interior. It's a building that he designed very straight, really straight after the um, dissolution of his partnership with James Sterling, and um, this idea of a a building of kind of severe um, plain exterior and 
elaborate interior was uh, a theme that kind of preoccupied him throughout his life and I think he associated it particularly with um, a Scottish tradition um, of architecture. He was of castles and he, he was um, a Glaswegian even though he was of sort of anglicised Scot and um, also and particularly with the work of Robert Adam, um, um, another anglicised Scot. Um, and this piece um, is really talking about that. So um, I think it's all self-explanatory. Um, but yes, the last sentence mentions the house on Hampstead West Heath, which is the one that, that um, the Schreiber house that I just referred to. So it's called Home, a Castle for an Englishman. I recollect that Sir John Summerson, who has done so much to promote an understanding of 18th century London, said surprisingly on one occasion that the Georgian city must have been very dull indeed. He was referring, one assumes, to the repetitiveness of the architecture, its restraint and the simplicity of its layouts. We can only speculate from illustrations if his, if his is a true assessment Engravings are a misleading guide as the steel point is committed to line, evenness of tone and limited gradation. However, one knows what he means. It's not enough to use Bath, Dublin or the new town at Edinburgh as a touchstone. London was on a much grander scale and the simple architecture, the long straight terraces and the wide expanses of cobbled thoroughfare would have lacked the variety pursued and valued by today's architects and would in these terms be seen to be dull. But it was the price that a society was prepared to pay for homogeneity, for an urban consensus, a declaration that they shared common cultural values and that it was vulgar to promote oneself out of one's class. So these restrictions too were recognised and held in common. Unlike Philadelphia or New York, the topography of London cannot be unravelled at a glance. But simplistically, there are three components to its central structure. The original city and its rural appurtenances, the Georgian gridiron overlay and the great city parks. The Thames winds for all this and its serpentine path disorientates the citizen on every encounter. It inhibits formal and spectacular essays in town building and reinforces, perhaps even predicates, pragmatism and improvisation. Latent and natural tendencies, always at the ready and probably genetically founded in an affection, a predilection for the small scale, variety and incident of the English countryside. The original street patterns have been decimated by war and development in equal measure. Indeed, it's only recently with Hermione Hophouse's book, Lost London, that one has become aware of the losses due to continual, sustained, individual philistinism. One tended to blame the urban clearances on official numbness, but it is now quite apparent that the private person and many institutions have made a determined and full contribution to the process of dismantling a culture. If one may quote Lost London on Devonshire House by William Kent, built in 1733 for the third duke, the modesty of the house was not universally admired, and one contemporary compared it to an East India Company warehouse. This was less kind than Augustus Hare in 1878, who found it a perfectly unpretending building. Of Haircut House by Thomas Archer, one of the most singular pieces of architecture about town, rather like a convent than a residence uh, for a man of quality. The catalogue of devastation is enormous and would be tedious to extend here, but of the several interesting facts which emerge from it, one is the plain, that the plain buildings, such as Harewood House by Adam and the Adelphi, described by Rasmussen as simple classical houses with their Pompeian decorated pilasters. They seem to have been the most vulnerable and the prey of selective elimination, a cultural pruning, an Orwellian revision. At any rate, this part of the range of architectural language 
has been eliminated almost entirely from our urban experience, leaving only bookish references and a few fragments of this restrained lineage, such as Sion House with its monastic profile and its sophisticated interior refurbishments in the 18th century. And this brings up a second interesting point, where one is discussing buildings of plain fabric and elaborate interior, one finds that many of these are associated with the name of Robert Adam. This dialectic between exterior and interior is peculiarly Scottish in the sense that the castle is the model. And whilst the English could discard um, the type when fortification became unnecessary, or at least accept substantial modification, the Scots still had to contend with weather or choose to make a priority of such defensiveness. The distinction is between style and usage and is polarised by two building types. Indeed, there are, only, uh, there, uh, there are only two such classifications, all buildings being variants or hybrids of one or the other. The pavilion, open, extrovert, fashionable, etc. And the castle, closed, secretive, timeless, etc. The house on Hampstead West Heath is in the latter genre, as are several others in this rural locality. It forfeits external and public display for reasons of both weather and taste, and within it is preoccupied with the concerns of exacting family use and their fulfilment. Um, and now I'm going to read three short pieces, super short, um, which maybe give you a sense of James's kind of um, perceptiveness, but also maybe his porky Glaswegian humour. Um, the first one's called Sketches for the Wall of a Room. Some years back, I read a programme for the AA Diploma School on the domestic refurbishment of the room I worked in. Large, bay-windowed, scruffy. Unusually so, there was a big response. The projects filled several rooms and were restless with ideas and complications. One project was different, and I thought then, a little facile. But the images stayed with me. It's an ink line drawing of the room, empty, and as it was when new, clean, with the ornamental plasterwork perfect and precise. There was a second drawing, which was a repeat of the first, except for an open suitcase in the middle of the floor. This was crammed and neatly compartmented with everything one needed, a heater, bedding, books, all trimmed down to essentials. The drawings and their implications have needled me occasionally since. Though I regard myself as observant in architectural matters, I had never seen my room as a fresh, fine space, only as a room in transition, genteely fighting off seediness. Secondly, the drawings arrested or questioned my thoughts on architecture the grand spread of design and action that was unlikely ever to be realised, and the possibility that architecture of the future would have more to do with the shrinking compass of events, the room significantly, and perhaps its enrichment with cultural symbols and gestures not attainable by any other means. There are signs enough that the promise for many may be no better than a slice of old building stock and our nearest visual experience of what this might be is through photographs and films of the immediate post-revolutionary Russia. Stark rooms and stripped shared establishments. In such a condition, the architect's role, if it continued to exist at all, could shrink to advising on the most simple requirements. Where best to hang one's finery? Where best to place a precious nail in the wall? I think that's written in the mid seventies, kind of um, in um, just after the oil crisis. Things weren't looking so good. Um, the next one is called "The Old and the New," and it starts with a um, about two or three sentence quote from Harold Nicholson's Diaries and Letters. Um, and Aaron Bevan says an interesting thing. He says that we intellectuals are in a difficult position. Our tastes attract us to the past, our reason to the future. 
Hitherto we have been able to appease this conflict since our tastes were still able to find their outlets, whereas our reason could indulge in the picture of the sh shape of things to come. Now, however, the future is becoming very imminent and we are faced with the fact that our tastes can no longer be indulged. Gone are ease and income and travel and, and elegance. There's a tendency, therefore, for the weaker souls to escape into mysticism. Their reason tells them that the future is right, is right but it is agony for them to lose the past. That's the quote from Nicholson. And James carries on. Um, the prospect that Mies van der Rohe sketches from the living room of his houses is, quiet, is a quiet piece of traditional landscape. Grass, trees, hedges, and an occasional sailing boat. It's in a secluded setting, uninhabited and totally familiar. It could be said that a Mies house is concerned primarily with its outlook, but it's an interior place from which the past is relished, as if it is a painting, with composure, distance, and the superiority that new technology invokes. It could perhaps be said that the introduction of a building into this ideal landscape would be unfortunate. The sense of isolation would be lost, but if there had to be a building in the vista, an old farmhouse, something ageless, would do no great harm. A modern building would be less acceptable, however. It would be an obstruction, a competitor, another young bull. At best, a modern building is a place for looking at old buildings or a piece of the past. The contrast makes the scene more pleasurable, the distinction more acute. Perhaps modern architecture has only thrown up one or two good ideas, that the captive view is one of them and that it is not a unique style at all. If the generality of this argument is reversed and tested by consideration, there's not a lot of joy in looking at a modern building from a traditional setting. The experience is something of an embarrassment, a challenge too, for any occupant given to introspection, harboring doubts and sitting in front of the glass. Um, so that maybe is uh, kind of suggestive of uh, the fact that um, James was um, somewhat sceptical about the, the course of uh, contemporary um, events. Um, and there's uh, certainly about the development of modern architecture. Um, and although he kind of got involved somewhat with um, the development of postmodernism, if anyone's seen the Royal College of Art um, bookshop, you will be, um, that's probably the high point of his um, um, of his involvement, um, but there's there's also a um, I guess the, the house in Chester is another another uh, example. But I think he was certainly sceptical about the, um, the whole development. Um, I am here we go. I was failing to find it, um, but yeah, the, the, here is a very short piece, which I'm going to conclude on, um, which maybe kind of exemplifies. Um, his thoughts about the postmodern. Um, this would be written in the mid 80s. It's called the McGlurglan phenomenon. The most interesting architectural event of the last 10 years has undoubtedly been the discovery of the master of McGlurglan's projects and drawings. These and his sketchbooks, found by chance in the porridge drawer of his button Ben at Atlantic are now happily in the safekeeping of the Sohn Museum. So important to the staff of, the polar, of its polar division consider the hoard that unbeknown to the curator, they've chucked out quite a lot of rubbish, or to be more correct, lesser material, to make space for the new collection. Dustbins are piled high with Adam's drawings, which it is felt are not likely to be missed for a generation or more because of the current outburst of populist whimsicality. A phase they gauge is likely to herald in the millennium, unless, of course, there's something else around the corner to catch the restless attention of what McGlurglan amusingly referred to as one of the oldest professions. But this is a risk that has to be taken, 
and the McGlurglin drawings are a joy, full of ideas, every elevation crammed tight with crow-stepped gables and its several variants, none of which was particularly effective in its heyday, but no matter, quite good enough to be dragooned into the action. To drape such features with plastic pipework is an exciting prospect, and the lecture series that is planned is irresistible. The first is Building in the Mist, the second in the freezing rain, and the last in three feet of water. It's a charming surprise in store for the audience. It looks certain to be a complete success, and even if it's not, it will be a change, for after all, that is what matters. McGlurglin would have approved wholeheartedly, for he never tired of asking, as Socrates, as, as Socrates was wont to do, mayor of this or mayor of that. Unfortunately, a convenient deafness which overtook him at a Ruskin lecture prevented him from savouring the many ingenious replies which his wild entourage shouted back at him. Um, the observant among you will have noticed that behind my shoulder uh, there is a um, cabinet which is um, uh, this is one of the uh, prototypes for the Schreiber range of furniture which um, James designed after the he, he did all the furniture on the same sort of model really for the Schreiber house and the Schreiber was a um, um, a furniture manufacturer and they put the the um, the system into um, into production with slightly narrower um, yeah, kind of, yeah narrower timber I think the original was sort of inch thick inch thick teak veneer but um, this is a prototype so this is um, um, an apple veneer and this this one was in uh, James Gowan's office um, until he died um, so the, yeah his, his office at uh, Notting Hill was was full of um, these prototypes but I think it's a very beautiful thing um, thanks everybody and um, good night <laughs>